Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. It's always one of our favorite times of the month when we can take our virtual field trip to the Virginia Zoo. Today, we're lucky enough we get to hang out with zookeeper Haley, and she's going to teach us all about the rhinoceros uh, hornbills today. So, Haley, it's so great to have you joining us live. Looks like a beautiful day at the Virginia Zoo. How uh, are our guests of honor doing today? They're doing well. So we are, we do have two rhinoceros hornbill right now. Ryobi, our male, is the only one that wants to be featured. Una might come and join us in a little bit. Hopefully she'll see these delicious grapes and come down. But she is up in the trees at the moment. All right. Very cool. Well, the hornbills uh, obviously aren't something we're going to find in the wild in North America. Can you tell us a little bit about where they're found, their habitat, and a little bit about what they do. Yeah, so um, like I said, we have two individuals. Both were raised in captivity and born in captivity, but their wild counterparts can be found all through Southeast um, Asia, like Indonesia, Malaysia, um, Singapore, places like that. So they belong in the thick forests of those islands. Um, so it's really great that we're able to give them such a nice, large exhibit here. They can get real high up in the trees. Um, they can fly around real easily. So it's, it's a great setup that, we're, that we have here. We're really, really lucky that we have it. So as I stated earlier, this is Ryobi. He's our male. Um, the most distinct difference between males and females outside of their size is their eye color. I think he's trying to call Una down. Um, Let's see. Una, come on. So outside of their size, the only way that you can really guarantee tell a difference between male and female, if you're just looking at them, is by their eye color. So Ryobi has a really nice dark red eye. And if Una comes down, she can flash you her beautiful baby blues. So that's the only real difference um, feature-wise. They do have that big old cask on their head. Um, that is made out of keratin, just like our nails. And just like our nails, they actually start out white. So they don't develop the cask until they're fledged away from mom and dad. Um, and then they start to develop a white horn that grows as they grow with age. And the coloration comes from an oil gland. So as they scratch their heads and rub on that oil gland, it stains those casts different colors or different shades of yellow, reds and orange. So each individual does have a unique look to them. Sorry, Una looks like she really wants to come down. Um, so these guys are going downhill as far as numbers go in the wild. They are classified as vulnerable with a decrease in population. There's no certain number in the population just because they're really hard to get to. Like I said, they live in those thick forests. Um, it's really a struggle to get enough people there to do a, a solid count of them, but they are declining. So it's really important that what we do here at the Virginia Zoo, as well as other zoos, is maintain a genetically diverse um, population. And that way we keep um, enough in captivity that if we were to ever need to release some individuals back into the wild to help out that population, we could. Um, some other interesting things about these guys, they are what's called a cavity nest builder. So these guys don't make your traditional cup size nest or um, like a woodpecker nest. They find a dead tree in their forest and he'll take that strong beak and hollow out the inside of it, she'll come inspect it. If she likes what she sees, um, she will lay her eggs in that hole and then he will mud her up. So he'll take um, fruit, he'll take some mud, maybe avocados, banana, um, and make a paste and actually hide her inside that tree to where you can only see the tip of her beak pointing out. He'll then feed her um, and feed the babies until they're old enough to break through that mud. So because of that, um, it's really, really important that we try our best to get the conservation message out to those areas to prevent forestation, to 
maintain their natural habitat as perfectly as possible. That's one of the main reasons why these guys are declining. That and unfortunately they are poached. So hunters will go out, mistake them for a different kind of hornbill. Um, sorry, so Ryobi right now just took some grapes over to Una, which he'll now feed her. So that's a really, really great example of their courtship behavior. So it's like they're flirting right now and she is accepting his flirt. So that's great for us to see. We're hoping in this next year to get some chicks from them. And that way we can oh, reach. Can they see him? Oh. Yeah, so that way we can, we can keep their genes going at the Virginia Zoo really well. These two are a great pair. They get along really, really well. Um, they've been together since 2010 and they are both 10 years old, born about a month, month and a half apart. So they're a great pairing. Cool to see them active and moving around the environment. If they do lay eggs, how many will they raise at a time? What was that? Uh, if they do, if it is successful and they do uh, lay some eggs, how many young will they raise at a time? Usually about three to five, just the standard amount, depending on how many. She has not laid yet. So usually, you know, the first time moms, it's a little difficult. So it might be a little less than what we expect, but somewhere around there. All right. So you mentioned that they are vulnerable to poaching. Now, I know there's a species of hornbill called the helmeted hornbill and they're hunted for their, their casks. Is that the same thing that's happening with the rhinoceros hornbills? No, so they're actually an offshoot of that problem. So helmeted hornbills are hunted strictly for that cask. It's extremely valuable, um, more valuable than gold in some countries. So these guys are actually a case of mistaken identity. Poachers will go out, they'll mistake these guys for the helmeted, accidentally shoot and kill, and then oopsies walk away so it's really unfortunate that i mean as bad as poaching is there's no benefit at all to anyone when these guys get hunted all right um with the uh the animals at the zoo you said that these were uh captive raised yes so um they Zoo. All right, very cool. And I know to be able to fly, birds need to have really light bones, really light bodies. Are those casks very heavy or are they mostly hollow? Yeah, so these guys, these guys have mostly hollow bones. In general, birds have, I believe it's two bones in their wings and one bone in their leg that is not hollow like that. Um, and that does aid in them flying. It makes them really, really agile in the air, lightweight. Um, these guys are very loud flyers though. I don't know if you heard them as they were sweeping past. Um, they have that because they go through those dense forests, they need to be able to hear each other, to chat, to talk. Um, so it, it's a benefit to have those big, thick wings. Um, that cask, speaking of, the cask is also used to amplify sound. So it's really, really great when they have those big casts, they can yell at each other through the forest and really communicate really, really well. Now you mentioned when uh, the female does lay some eggs in the hollow part of the tree, the, the male kind of seals it up except for a little spot to drop food in. Mm -hmm. um, how long will she be sealed up with the young? I Four to five months. I might be a little off on that, um, but I believe it's about four to five months. And um, with that whole concept, it means that they have to be really, really good at regurgitating food, which is kind of gross, but these guys can hold on. I think the longest time I saw Ryobi hold on to a grape in his crop is at least half a day. So I came in and I was trying to get him to go inside for the night and I showed him a tasty treat and he regurgitated a grape in front of me and ate it instead of going inside. So they, they do have great personalities. They're intelligent as all heck. 
um, they solve problem puzzles and problems. I'm sorry, I have a bug on my neck. <laughs> um, so every day we come in, we give them enrichment, we'll give them parrot toys, we'll even give them dog toys. Those toys that you get um, when you have an overweight dog. So you have to try like make them eat slower. They figure those puzzles out in a matter of seconds. They are so intelligent. All right, very cool. Now I know, I know a lot of birds have uh, different mating displays, whether it's different calls, uh, different feathers, different aerial displays. What's uh, what's a typical mating display like for the rhinoceros hornbill? Yeah, so what I witness with him feeding her, that's the most common um, form of flattery, if you will. They're, they're pretty much the same color, the same size, the same cask. So everything else about them really doesn't differentiate from males to females. So the only real display is them talking to each other, chatting each other up, and then feeding each other. It's a bond that's really important, especially for the male to feed the female in that nest. If he can show her how good he is at feeding her outside of the nest, it's a really, really important part of their, of their uh, breeding behavior. So that's really all we get, just a lot of sounds and a lot of, a lot of feeding. So he's doing that right now. He's trying to give her a piece of grape. All right, what a gentleman. All right, well, hopefully they'll, they were sitting so nice before we started. So hopefully they'll come back down and give us another good view. But while we're waiting to see if that happens, Haley, would you like to meet some of the classrooms? We'll get some questions going. That would be great, thank you. All right, awesome. Well, let's get rolling. Let's start off. Let's go to, let's take a trip to Freehold, New Jersey to start. We've got some grade fives hanging out with Mrs. Hanlon's class. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, grade fives? Oh, we're good. All right, so come on over, Philip. Nope, you have to go around this way by Mrs. Capone. All right, so what's your question, Philip? What are the rhinoceros hornbill's predators? So their main predator is us. Um, outside of that, any any big mammal, any um, they're really aggressive towards each other. So that's a big worry for them. But they don't have that many predators. They are a big bird. So they scare away just about everyone and everything with that ginormous beak. All right, very cool question. Thanks for getting us started. Let's go over now. Let's take a trip to San Antonio, Texas. We've got some more grade fives hanging out with Mrs. Akel. Let me get her microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, San Antonio? Good. <laughs> What will happen to the ecosystem if they extinct? So these guys are really, really good with dispersal, um, and they're in those lush jungles. So they're really important um, with getting those trees grown up. So if they did go extinct, outside of it being unfortunate for everyone in general, you would have a lot fewer plants growing in their native in their native habitat. All right, very cool. So just like other species, species like monkeys, species like other birds, they can spread those seeds around from the fruits they eat. So that's an amazing uh, adaptation and really important for the rainforest ecosystem. Let's see, let's take a trip now to Cambridge. Mrs. Nipinska has some great forest hanging out with her. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing great forest? Brody, what's your question? Um, how do the birds get, how do the birds' food get to the little babies that are inside of the nest? So dad will fly around, find food, collect them all up in his beak, and then fly them back to mom, give them to the mom, and then the mom will feed all of her babies. And I want to build on that food question a little, because we know they definitely eat fruit, but I know some species of uh, bigger hornbills sometimes might eat a little meat. Do they uh, eat anything, maybe insects or any kind of meat? Yes, they do. So they have um, a really interesting, diverse diet in the wild. Um, we actually have to supplement because we can't give them the right amount of protein. So we have to give them additional food outside of just fruits. 
Um, but they can eat lizards, they can eat insects, maybe even a snake. They definitely get a lot more protein than what you'd think. Come on. Like All right, so take a quick trip and meet another classroom. Uh, Mrs. Christensen's class, uh, some grade four, fives, and sixes hanging out in Guelph, Ontario. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Guelph? We're ready. Send someone up for us. We have two or three questions. Quick ones. Is that um, okay? How do the males get the females' attention? They're really, really loud. Those, those big they amplifier, but it makes sound travel through multiple cars. Um, they just yell, and the lady, and she comes running. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, go ahead and squeak another one in. Okay. How were they bred? So how how were they bred? In Is he? You're cutting out. We're having troubles hearing you. Um, can you repeat your question? How were they bred? How were so they these bred? Two, they bred in captivity. Yeah. So these two bred in captivity. Um, it was a setup pretty similar to what we have, and they just had a nest already all set up for them. And like I said, the Phoenix Zoo and the Houston Zoo have great programs. And these these guys went into those nests, came out these beautiful, beautiful birds. I mean, yeah, I think he means like how not invent how are they created? Do you know what a mix? What they how they came where they came from ish? So um. I don't know that. Often. Yeah. You know that they're. Um, sorry, I actually had this just printed out. They share that feature, that cask feature, is really similar to the duck billed dinosaur back in the day. So I'm not sure if that's where they came from, but I know that that's a characteristic that they share way back when. All right. Great questions. Let's jump to our next classroom. Mrs. Reed's class, grade fives, hanging out in Algonquin. Um, I think that's Virginia, but you guys let me know if I'm wrong when I turn your microphone on. So let me get that turned on. How are we doing, Mrs. Reed's group? Good. It's Illinois. Is it Illinois? Uh, there's an Algonquin, Virginia, and Illinois. I was wrong. So Illinois, go ahead. Are all birds the same color? Are all of them what? The same. the same color. Yeah, they all have the same coloration as far as feathering. It's just the cast that gets to change color depending on how well they preen. So that, that orange and yellow and reddish almost, those are the ones that change color. All right, looks like someone wants to come back a little bit closer. All right, who's that one? Is that is that Una or? Yeah, this is Ryobi, the male. I okay. think Una's a little shy today. Gotcha, well, they're beautiful, beautiful birds. Oh, they are, they know it too. <laughs> All right, let's go to Mrs. Uh, Zach's class, some third graders, they're hanging out in Freehold, New Jersey. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, third graders? Hi. All right, who's up? All right, go ahead, Tim. How are the rhinoceros hornbills adapted to being relocated to the zoo? So these guys were in, in captivity in Houston and Phoenix, where it gets just as hot as here um, and almost as cold. So we do have that's inside that we keep eating or we keep Air conditioning they to be um, liking the temperature, so they do have their their own um, enclosure indoors, and we can temperature control that really well, especially in the cold, cold winters. So this uh, this is uh, if she's in view. All right, very cool. Uh, Mrs. Caesar's group, they're hanging out in British Columbia, some grade sixes. Let me get their microphone turned on for them. How are we doing grade sixes? 
Uh, well, what do the casts do? So their casts are made out of hair, like your nails, um, and they're hard inside. So it takes emitting, and it almost like reverberates around and amplifies it out. So their cask is really important for them to be as loud as possible. All right, another great question. So Haley, uh, before we do a swing around and meet some of our classrooms again, how long have you been working at the zoo? So I've only been working at the zoo for about six months, um, but I have worked with birds for about seven years now. And then at the zoo, what are some of the other uh, animals you get to work with? So we're extremely lucky here at the Virginia Zoo. We get to work with so many birds that are so um, uncommon in other locations. Most of our birds are from Asia. So we have like fairy blue birds, we have bulbuls, we have so many little tidbit birds all the way up to the big giant cassowaries that can get up to six and a half feet tall. So we have everything in between. Um, but definitely if anyone's ever coming to visit, take a look at our bird collection. It's really impressive. All right, very cool. I love the cassowaries. I spent some time in the Daintree in Australia and was lucky enough to see several males with their, their young, which is pretty oh, awesome. That's really impressive. That's, that's very uncommon to find. I know. We felt pretty lucky. The, the hostel we stayed at, they said there's no way we'd see any. And by the end of the weekend, we'd seen eight. So we, we wow. felt we were pretty darn lucky. That is awesome. All right. Well, let's take a swing back through. Let's uh, meet uh, our classrooms again. So we'll start in Mrs. Hanlon's class again and see if they have a follow-up question for us. So your microphone is on. Guys, have a seat. While I was researching the rhinoceros hornbill, is it true that they actually eat other birds? They eat other birds. So that's definitely not food of choice. Um, they're much more likely to get those little inverts and um, like spiders and lizards, things like that. But when push comes to shove, there's no other fruit around, so they might. But it's definitely not one of their common. All right, great question. Uh, let's see, where should we go next? Let's go to Mrs. Uh, Echo's class. Your microphone is on. <clears throat> uh, I was wondering if they were as smart as dolphins. So they're pretty smart. In my opinion, I think they're a little smarter, but technically, no. All right, fair enough. I can see as your keeper how you might be, a, their keeper, you might be a little bit biased. A little bit. All right, uh, let's see. Mrs. Reed's class, let's turn your microphone on again. How long have the birds been around? These two or the species? Just, just the species. Um, I cannot give you a proper answer for that one. You got me stumped on that. That's okay. We'll give them a little Google homework to check it out uh, afterwards. Uh, Mrs. Napinska's class, your microphone is on again. Okay. Uh, why are birds hollow? Oh. Their bones are um, somewhat hollow because if they're flying, they have to get all that weight up off the ground. So if they have hollow bones, it helps them be able to fly long, long distances without getting tired. All right. Great, great question. Um, maybe, Haley, can you tell us about a few more adaptations that birds have that help them with flight? Um, oh, yeah, so they have like a keel instead of all the bones that we have and the rib cage and everything. They're limited in the amount of bones that they have. Um, and their bones are more fused together than what we have. So it's helping them again in that whole thought process of them being lightweight. Um, their feathers are also specialized. So as their feathers grow, it uses blood, but then that's all taken out, making the feather even lighter. Uh, most birds have 10 primary feathers. Those are the feathers that are primarily used in flight. So without those, birds wouldn't be able to fly at all. And interestingly enough, if you go like this, 
you're making your own little bird wings. So they have the same bones that we have, but where we have these fingers, their bones are more fused together than what we have, but they have the same bones that we do in our arms, in their wings. All right, very cool. Let's take a trip back to Mrs. Zach's class. I'll turn your microphone on in New Jersey. Hi. I have a question. What caused the hornbills to become vulnerable? Hold on one second. I have a vehicle driving by. Can you repeat that? A little louder. What caused the hornbills to become vulnerable? So why are they vulnerable? Um, because people started taking away the forest. So it's deforestation. Um, these guys also rely on dead trees. So sometimes people want to get rid of those eyesores um, and then poaching. All right. Uh, where do we still need to go? Here we go. Uh, Guelph, Ontario, do you guys have any more questions for us? Uh, is it true that some of these birds can in seriously injure or kill humans? So these guys can be pretty territorial, um, but it's less people having to worry and more the birds have to worry about other hornbills. So I'm sure they could do a decent amount of damage, but they don't really mind people since we're at the bottom of the forest floor. They tend to stay up and care more about what's flying around them pretty high up. Now, with that territorialness, does that extend to other species? If something was near the nest, would they, you know, do a pretty good job of chasing them away? Yeah, they would do a great job. They are big birds and they are intimidating looking, especially with that, that cask on their head. Um, but they have been known to share a nest once they're done with it. Someone else can come in and use that nest um, as their own. But it's more hornbill to hornbill that they're just fighting for that location altogether. All right. Well, just the sound of their wings when they fly over, you can hear that big kind of whooshing sound. Uh, it's pretty impressive on its own. All right. Mrs. Caesar's class in British Columbia, your microphone is on. Um, this is a weird question, but do birds sneeze? Birds do well, sneeze. Sneezing earlier today. This time of year, all of our birds are sneezing. All right, very cool. So I wanted to give a quick shout out. Uh, Mrs. Irwin's class is hanging out uh, with us. I believe they're in Colorado. So they're watching on YouTube and I can see there's a few more classrooms. So if any classrooms do have any questions, please send them in uh, the YouTube chat sidebar and I'll keep an eye out for those uh, and put some of those questions in. Uh, but for now, we've been had a great hangout. We've been able to visit each classroom twice. So I'm gonna open things up. And if your class has another question, give me a big wave at the camera so I know to come visit your class again. Oh, Haley, lots of hands. We're going to have to visit a few more classrooms. Uh, Mrs. Hanlon's class, your microphone is on. Are rhinoceros hornbills related to toucans? <laughs> they are. So they're a totally different branch. They just look kind of similar. All right, very cool. I imagine that their bills are kind of built the same way, but the hornbills kind of have that really cool kind of cask on top to set them apart. Right. All right, awesome. Uh, okay, lots of waving in San Antonio. So let's get Texas, grade fives, your microphone is on. How long can they live for? So in captivity, they're known to live around 35 years. Not as long in the wild, but that's because in captivity, we take our birds to the vet if they get sick and we can make sure that they eat enough. Um, but around, we're gonna expect these guys to live to be around 35. All right, very cool. Uh, okay, waving in Mrs. Napinska's class. Let's get that microphone on. If a female and a male are the same age, can they be the same size or different sizes? So usually the males are a little bit bigger than the females. Um, but just like in humans, some people are bigger than other people. There is some variation, but typically the males are a little bit bigger. All right, so just got to look in at Mrs. Nepinska's class. Looks like a lot of kids in there. How many students do we have hanging out there today? 
I have 50, no clue. Over 50. 49. Over 50. Very cool. All right. Well, great questions. Uh, where else do I see waving? Oh, I see waving. That looks like we need to go back to Mrs. Zach's class. Let's get that mic. Okay, go ahead. How do the hornbills use their beaks to catch and eat their prey? Can you repeat that? Um, how do the hornbills use their beaks to catch and eat their prey? Oh, so um, they're just really, really well coordinated. So they're able to catch all of my bad throws. Um, and if anything's falling from a tree, they can catch that. And then they just throw it up in the air and swing it back. Um, kind of like if you're eating sunflower seeds at a baseball game and you just toss them back, just like that. All right, very cool. Uh, okay, back to Guelph. I can see a couple waivers. Um, do the males have a special type of song or dance? So they make like really deep kind of guttural sounds. I wouldn't really call it anything too special. Um, but they're very loud and obnoxious when they want to get the female's attention. So they kind of just grunt and, and make weird guttural sounds towards each other. Um, I'm sure that it's specialized in rhino hornbill land, but nothing to where us humans have really defined it. All right, awesome. And we should visit Mrs. Reed's class again because we've made three swing throughs today, which is awesome. So let's see if Mrs. Reed's class has one more question. Who wants to ask a question? Go ahead, Burger. How old is Ryobi? Ryobi is 10 years old. And I think uh -oh. he's in August. So he's going to be 11 soon. All right, so I've got a question. Uh, for you, Haley, that hasn't come up yet. I'm wondering about conservation. Is there anything that classes, you know, North America, it's far away, but is there anything they can do to help protect the hornbill? Yeah, so just spreading the word. I mean, no one ever knows where they'll be once they grow up and all you kids are gonna start making those decisions in a few years. So keep rhino hornbills in the back of your mind if anything ever pops up. Just really spreading the message around as much as possible to help prevent deforestation in general as we go about our day, you know, getting some eco-friendly um, like items when you buy things from the grocery store. I'm sorry, my, my words are not coming out that well. Um, but just being mindful in all regards. So the palm oil, the palm oil problem, um, making really good and responsible decisions in your daily life can help them out. And then if you grow up and become a zookeeper, you can help them directly. All right. Well, I think this is the perfect question to end off on because one thing I've noticed is everybody uh, who has a job, whether it's science or exploration or conservation, they all take very different pathways to get to really cool jobs. Can you tell us a little bit about your path uh, that led you to where you are today? Yeah. So I started in the wildlife rehabilitation field. Um, when I was 16, I was volunteering with raptors, so birds of prey. Um, and then once I graduated, I was helping out with sea otters in Monterey Bay Aquarium. And then I got my first job at a zoo um, running their wildlife rehab where we in took all native animals to California. Um, and then I found myself in Virginia being the lead bird keeper. So it's definitely transitioned a little bit, but mostly stayed with the birds. All right, very cool. Well, your job is taking you all over the place. That's awesome. Um, well, first of all, Haley, thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us today, for uh, teaching us about the hornbills and, of course, about uh, what you do at the zoo. That was a lot of fun. And uh, a big thank you to Emily. I know she's behind the scenes with the camera. So, Emily, thank you so much for helping out today. And uh, to your, the classrooms, as always, the questions were awesome. Thanks so much for spending a little bit of time with us. And, of course, to our hornbills who kind of popped in and out, but they gave us some pretty solid views. So thanks so much for that today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, Haley, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the microphones on in the classroom. So classrooms, if you want to get nice and loud, a big goodbye and thank you. Uh, hopefully our rhinoceros hornbills can hear you as well. Here we go. Microphones are coming on.
You guys are always so good at that. I heard that nice and loud in my headphones, so I have no doubt that the Hornbills heard that as well. So again, Haley, Virginia Zoo, thank you so much. A lot of fun. We can't wait for our next field trip. Well, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. All right. See you later, everyone. Thank you.